middle of uh, a Heart for the House series. This is a series we do uh, once a year, usually several weeks. And, and we just celebrate all that God has done in the house. But we're also looking ahead to all that he is going to do. And we just believe, not just uh, as your pastors, Amy and I, but I believe the Lord wants every believer to be able to say that about the house, the church that they're in, that there's no place like home. You know, that wasn't just Dorothy's saying because she was lost in a, in a tornado. There was, there's this thing in us that we need a place to belong, a place to believe, a place to grow and develop. And God gave us that in the local church. And every Christian should have a home. Every Christian should have a place that they can belong. And right now we say, man, there are so many churches. Maybe you drove past so many on your way to this church, to your house today. But if there were, right now, even if all of those churches were filled to capacity, there would not be enough churches to, for, for everybody to be able to say there's no place like home. That, that, that there's just, there's not. There are so many people, seven out of ten people in West Georgia don't have a church home. They don't have a place. They belong and they fit. In. And just to give you some simple math, if you go into Publix and there's 100 people there, 70, 70 of those people don't have a church home. And, and so 30% of us do, praise God for that. But man, we've got work to do. And there's a reason that you and I are here. And so every person should have a personal relationship with Jesus, but every person should have a personal relationship with their local church. And, and so part of Heart for the House is for us to celebrate, man, our hearts are in this house and so much has happened. Do you know there's been, there's been 51 families that have made this, this house a place where their heart is planted this year? 51 families, yeah. And I just want you to think about this. Think about the ripple effect of that. 51 families represents how many generations? I mean, how many people are being touched and changed? And then how many of those 51 families do they go to workplaces that, that seven out of 10 people don't know Jesus, who have kids that go to school and in those schools, seven out of 10 people don't have a relationship with Jesus. So there is just so much that God can do through our, our hearts being planted in the house. And the first week we talked about having a heart in the house means you have a heart for generosity. And LifeGate, you are a generous church. If, if uh, you're wondering how, man, you can look at uh, Heart for the House landing page on our website, or there's a, I saw a stack of our books. Uh, our team did a great job putting together just right there a visual of you being able to flip through and look at all that your generosity has done this year. Uh, a heart for generosity. And then a heart for the house um, is, is a heart for freedom. And Amy preached it up last week and brought a word. I'm telling you, it's She's always good, but this is the best message I've ever heard about why you serve in your house. I mean, it was incredible. And, and, and I, I have never felt more energized than I do right now to be a sandal taker offer. And if you don't know what that means, go listen to the message. I encourage you to do that. And then actually last week, at, we had a way for you to respond. And that was our Say Yes rally that's on the patio. Maybe you saw some balloons coming in. You're like, whose birthday is it? And, and it's not a birthday. It's a Say Yes rally. And we want to invite you to say yes to serving in the house. Uh, it, it's, there are no excuses. There are no, there are no, maybe you have different sh constraints on your time. Maybe you have a different capacity than you once did, but there is no reason that a life gator should not be serving in the house. It's not something that we want from you. It's something we want for you. We know God can use your gift, the things that are inside of you to serve this place. And we want, listen, if seven out of 10 of our friends and our influence, uh, uh, those that we influence and those around us don't have a church yet, that means when I serve in the house, it makes this a place where they can come and say, there's no place like home. So there's, it's not just so that we can come and go, look how cool we are at using our gifts. I mean, we got a pretty killer band. Did you hear? I mean, that was, that was sick. That, that means good things. And for those that are like, who's sick? They're coughing. And, and, but, but, but it's not just so that we can come around and go, man, we're awesome because we serve. It's not for that. It's for a purpose of taking off the sandal. And I don't want to preach Amy's message from last week so you can listen to it, but we are communicating the heart of God when we serve in, in our church. And so today you can say yes to serving in the house. If you're not, just do it. 
I think somebody told us that on the video last week. Just do it. Just start doing it. If you've got 30 minutes a week, there's a place for you to serve. If you, what, whatever your capacity, I promise we can help you connect that to serving in this house. And there is this fulfillment that is just beyond imagination when you begin to use your gifts for what God is doing here. And then this week, we're, so it's, it's incredible. Think about this. He uses our generosity. So he's the only one that can turn a dollar into a, to a soul to touch eternity. God's the only one that can do that. God's the only one that can take a moment when you serve and turn it into eternity. So when we give God our resources, our money, when we give God our moments, he changes eternity. And I want to talk to you about today about having a heart for others, because when you, when there, there is no limit to what God can do through your invite the power of your invite. When we care enough about others, th- think about this. Uh, think, th- think about the last time you got an invitation. Uh, what did that invitation communicate? Sometimes they're formal, sometimes they're informal, but, but no matter what the case, that invitation communicates two things. It communicates that you're important and it communicates that that person wants you to be a part of something big, to be a part of something special. And you go, no, 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 I don't care if I get invited to, to anything. I'm really not that person. I don't need to be invited. Uh, yeah, right. So how does it make you feel when you're not invited? And that shows you the significance of, of an invitation. And, and you ever got one of those wedding invitations and, it, and it's like 16 envelopes and you just keep opening it, you know, and there's another envelope and then there's another envelope. And I feel so bad. It's like so much work and trees have gone into that project. I don't want to throw it away. It's beautiful. And then those envelopes that, that sometimes uh, your, your pastors give their staff and it has, it's full of confetti. And when it opens up, it explodes with glitter and confetti. Amy does that. I don't because I'm saved. And, and so, uh, but that leaves a lasting impression, you know, of glitter and confetti. And not just that, it communicates to the person that, that you gave it to that they have value, that you see them, that they're, they're noticed. When you get a text and somebody says, hey, I miss you, I'd love to have lunch with you. What does that communicate? That, that you have value, that they notice you, that they're significant. When, when you, when you uh, call somebody and you just say, I just called to say... Yeah. And if it's somebody you're not that close with, that could be weird. But, but you know what I'm saying? It communicates value, communicates significance, and it communicates that you want that person to be a part of what's going on. You know, Jesus was the best inviter of all times. And he invited us not just to relationship with him, but he invited us to change the world with him. He invited us to be a part of something big. And we're going to look at that in just a minute. But I want you to hear from a personal story that happened in this house, because there's no place like home. Take a listen to George and Sean's story. So I'm Sean, and we got our start here at LifeGate because someone invited uh, my wife, Brittany, to attend here. Um, That was about, oh man, 10 years ago. After planning my heart here at LifeGate, my whole leadership style at work has completely changed. Coming to LifeGate and really learning people are purposeful and what our roles as people are to one another um, really looks like, I've completely changed the way that I lead people. It's a heart-led leadership style now. When I invite people to come to LifeGate, I hope that they experience what I experience coming here. The people, the love, of the people here, the love of Jesus in this house. And and really, I mean, when you walk in on a Sunday morning and worship is happening, you can absolutely feel the presence of God in in the house. And my heart for people now has encouraged me to listen to them, hear them, and then not just give them some, you know, out of the book answer, but really point them in the direction of what the word says about their life and introduce them to the Holy Spirit. So let me tell you a little bit about more. So we worked together um, for about a year, year, almost a year and a half. And one of our first encounters where he and I were uh, in an office together, um, he stopped and asked the question, uh, are you a pastor? And I said, no. I said, what gave, what gave you that impression? And he says, well, I've never heard a manager or, or had a boss that stopped at the end of a meeting to pray. Uh, you know, we started talking about LifeGate and, and my church and seeing Morge come to LifeGate and become a part of 
the worship team, just meet and greet with people, attend um, the men's events that we have here, really inspires me to continue looking for people that can come and join and be a part of LifeGate. There is no place like home. So, Sean and I worked together um, at Stoutwire in Carrollton. Um, it started off with uh, definitely a boss employee relationship where we were talking about stuff of course associated with work and then over time somehow our relationship expanded from definitely something that more was centered toward um, things personally a person about him and I and then of course that went from that to we both found out that we were both Christians it felt natural I guess considering how our relationship progressed it wasn't something that was forced it definitely wasn't something where he actually push it upon me, I'll put any type of pressure for me to actually come to his um, to church. Of course, John looked for the opportunity to see that that was something that I was looking for personally, and then kind of eased that um, conversation in towards me. For me, when I, when I came into the church, um, I felt comfortable. But also, personally for me, it was just time to come, I guess in a sense, come back home. Since Sean invited me, um, I went all in. Coming to um, Grope Nights, I was um, doing the Freedom Series, uh, I joined the choir, um, the branch off of the playback team. I definitely decided that if I'm going to do this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go all in and pretty much get involved. There's no place like home. <laughs>
to the local church, they would say yes. Here's what's even more staggering. 25 to 35% of those people will spend the rest of their days in the local church once they come. So how is God building his church? Through you. Through the power of your invite. How did it all start with the greatest inviter of all times, Jesus? Remember one of the first things that he did as he started to build a team of disciples was come, follow, come on, help me finish it, me. Come follow me. Matthew, or uh, sorry, Mark 1 through 17. This invitation to come follow Jesus is through all the gospels. We're going to look at it in Mark, and then I want to show you a really cool ripple effect of that same story in the book of John. But first, I want you to look, Mark 1, 17, and he said to them, this is Jesus' invitation on the beach to the fishermen. Come follow me, and I will transform you into men who catch people instead of fish. I'll transform you into people. I will is a promise, and how many of you know he keeps his promises? But then he said, I'm going to do something. He said, I will, but you will. And so I want you to see this, that, that, that having a heart for others is not just following Jesus, it's also finding others. It's following and finding. And, and it's so cool to me that Jesus put this in the same sentence. In the same place that he invited us to come and follow him, he commissioned us to find others. That's pretty cool. Let me, let, let, look at this. It says, I will. We know he saves, he delivers, he restores. You can bank on it. If he says it, he's gonna do it. That's the I will promise of God. You are a result. Well, let me just ask you, anybody got a testimony and you are a result that God will keep his promise and do whatever he, I mean, we just sang about it. We're here because he will. And if he says it, he will do it. If you, maybe you're in a season right now where you're like, man, I need God to I will. He already has. And if you will trust him and follow him, you will realize that he is the God of promises, not just to others, but to you. And he will always keep his promise. But then he says, you will. So these guys were fishing. <laughs> some say that they were good. Some say that they were not so good. So historically, we know they were good. When Jesus shows up, remember, they weren't fishing. They weren't doing too well because they had fished all night and hadn't caught anything. And Jesus does some pretty cool stuff with that. But but either way, this was their occupation. They were making a living at fishing. Jesus invites them to make a difference. Not just a living, but a difference. You know that you're not here just to have a job, just to have a family, just to have hobbies, just to make money. I want you to think about the eternal impact of our time here, whatever that is, our space in all of eternity. Jesus is not waiting his return. Right, right now, the picture in heaven is that he is waiting on the Father to send him to us in the second coming. By the way, the stuff you're seeing happening in the Middle East, whew, it's getting close. I mean, we are living in, we, I mean, it's happening right before our eyes. So we need to pray, we need to be awake, and we need to do our job at making sure that all the people that we know around us have a relationship with Jesus because he's coming back soon. So, so with that, with the fervent, with with the the uh, uh, the fervency of heaven, and the 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 sometimes the fervency of heaven doesn't match the way I live my life here. The day that Jesus came and called them, they were not living in this anticipation of being a part of something big, but Jesus invited them into it. I think what happens sometimes, y'all, is that we get the invitation from Jesus, and and that right there. Was, was this miraculous moment. I want you to think back at how special it was when you, when, when you felt him touch your heart, whether you were a kid, whether you were an adult, maybe you were sitting in one of these blue chairs and you remember that, that, you, that that moment Jesus called you and you gave your heart, you surrendered your heart to him. What a beautiful moment. Nobody can ever take that from you. Man, that leaves you marked. It leaves you changed. And, and so I, I used to struggle at when, um, when was the time that I said yes to Jesus, you know, when, when Jesus saved me, because I asked a thousand times. I was so scared that I lost my salvation. I was so scared that, you know, uh, that I'm like, what if he comes back? You know, and there used to be this song, he'll come back again. And I was like, I, it was like terror. I was so afraid, man, I got to get saved. And so every day I got saved again and again and again and again. And I remember as an adult, I, Lord, everybody else remembers their moment. You know, this special moment I called on the Lord and heaven opened and he said, you are mine. And you know, and I'm like, I don't have one of those moments. Jesus, when did you save me? And he said, the first time you asked. And I went, oh. Okay, I'm pretty, I'm good with that. The first time I asked you, you know when he saved you? 
the first time you invited him into your heart, that you believed in him. When you call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be, little King James there for you, you shall be saved. It's a beautiful moment. When you were born, it was a beautiful moment. When you were born again, an even better moment. You know what the next greatest moment is? When you realize why. When you wake up to the fact that God has called me to be a part of something big. This call that Jesus gave the disciples, come follow me, it was descriptive in that there was a promise, but it was also prescriptive in that there was an assignment. God doesn't save you without an assignment. It's not that he wants something from you. He just invited you. It's a great honor to be a part of what he's doing. You know why it's called the great commission? He could have, he could have done this any way he wanted, but the great commission, see the great invitation is when, when it changed me. The great commission is when it changes the world. You, you get that. So there's this, this dual purpose in when he invites us to come and follow him. And here's the danger. There's too many people thinking they're following Jesus, but they're not finding other people on his behalf. Like there's this, lull that happens so we remember the moment that we were saved but we don't remember why like he didn't just save us eternity heaven is not the point the relationship with jesus is the point and when you're so in love and in relationship with jesus you can't help but talk about him when you love your church you can't help but talk about it when you when you love something i mean think about the products i mean you can scroll social media and you look at all these personal, uh, you know, people unwrap a box of Jordans and it's like, oh my goodness, look, they unwrapped the box of Jordans and then they, they folded the paper. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I mean, any kind of product, a new makeup product, a new, a new whatever your thing is, but all of a sudden you can know what your thing is because you've looked at it enough and now it shows up on all your feeds. Why is this showing up? Because you look at it and, and then all of a sudden it's trying to sell you something. It's trying to give you something. Well, you know what? We got the best product of all. His name is Jesus. And when people bump into us, whether it be a text or a phone call, or they work in the cubicle next to us or sit in class next to us at school, you know what should come out when they bump into us? Jesus and his church. Jesus and his church. Jesus and his church. And you go, well, how how does that come out? It comes out in a lot of different ways. It comes out through a lot of different personalities. You know, I thought it was interesting that Morge thought Sean was a pastor. And it's not that... Sean was a pastor. Sean was a preacher. Because Amy and I are the pastors of this church, but we're not the preachers of this church. We're all preachers. Preacher isn't a position. Preacher is is an assignment. And Jesus told us, or Paul told us in Romans, that if we don't go, then how will they know? If we don't use our lives as a platform, whatever that platform may look like, and you may sit here today and you go, man, I don't have a lot of influence. I, I work from home and I, and I have this and that you do over your household, over your babies. Maybe the greatest thing you ever do in life are the children that you raise at your house. Maybe the greatest assignment on your life and the purpose that he has there isn't just to follow Jesus, but is something that he does through you. And so it causes this thing to happen inside of us as, man, I can't just follow Jesus. I've got to find people on, on his behalf. And so a heart for others one is one that follows and finds. And then secondly, a heart for others ripples and reflects. So you think about it like water. You think about it like it ripples uh, because there is this ripple effect that happens. I want to show you a really cool story in the book of John. And, and then there's this reflection of something very special that anybody could, could, God could have done it any way he wanted, but he chose to do it through us, a reflection of him. So, so look at uh, with, this, with me in the, in the scripture, John 135. And, and there's several verses here, but I want you just to pick up with me, track with me the ripple effect of what, of what happens through one person to another person. All right, one person through another person. It says, one day John saw him again. This was John the Baptist. He was visiting with two of his disciples. As Jesus walked by, he announced again, do you see him? This man is the lamb of God, God's sacrifice to cleanse our sins. And at that moment, the two disciples began to follow Jesus. <laughs> so look at this. This is kind of comical to me. These two disciples were John the Baptist's disciples. They were following John. They were probably helping in, in baptism, which we're about to do. Anybody excited? It's baptism Sunday. So, so John's been baptizing. He's been doing his ministry. But then Jesus walks into town. So can you just imagine they're all sitting and Jesus walks by and they're all like, 
wow, that's him. And John does this pretty, it's actually a fulfillment of a, 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 a prophecy, but he looks at him, he says, that's Jesus. He's the lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. Now, two of John's friends and his followers look to John and go, deuces, we're, we're leaving. See you, that's Jesus. We'll see, we'll see you one day again, but man, we got to follow Jesus. Here's the deal. In, the fo- in order to follow Jesus, you're going to have to leave something behind. To really follow Jesus, there's going to be something we let go of. A sacrifice, something you let go of. They let go of John, they begin to follow Jesus. We know one of these uh, disciples, his name was Andrew. I'm thinking the other one is not named in scripture, but it's probably the 13th disciple named Michael. So it was Andrew and Michael. And, and these two guys left John the Baptist and they started following Jesus. Now, now let's just pick up the story and see what happened. This, was, this is so cool to me. He says, at that moment, the two disciples began to follow Jesus who turned back to them saying, what is it that you want? So Jesus turns back at Andrew and John because they're just following him. Let's just, let's just set this up. Is that okay with y'all? You guys, will you help me? Only three people said okay, but that's all right. I got the microphone so we can do it. All right. So, so you, you guys now, I'm just going to be pretend like I'm Jesus. All right. And so I'm, I'm walking. You guys just follow me. So Jesus is walking. I'm sure Jesus kind of, I don't know how he walked, but some kind of walk. And then... And then he turns around, he's like, what do you want? Have you ever done this? Somebody's standing like next to you, maybe too close, like they're a space invader, like your kid. It's like this, <laughs> felt you. Huh. And, and they, you know they want something and it's like, dude, what can, what's up? What can I do for you? We were camping the other day. This guy walks up. In the middle of our, we're, we're camping. Camping's kind of a private thing. Hanging out with my family at the campfire. This guy walks up, just stands there. I'm like, dude, we're in the middle of the woods. You, sh- what do you want? You go, you're a pastor. I know I'm a pastor, but I'm like, I'm going to take you out with my marshmallow skewer, you know. My, what's happening? And he, he. And his campfire had sent him over. That's what he said. My campfire sent me over. By the way, if your campfire is talking to you, that's weird. And, and, and his campfire had sent him over to get firewood. So I gave him, I was like, you want my firewood? And he said, yeah. So I gave him, I said, yeah, you know, we're generous. We're life gators. We're generous. So I gave him two pieces. And, and he said, he said well, well, actually three or four would be better. I said, I'm not that generous. Go on back to your fire. <laughs> anyway, sorry. First service didn't get that, but you did. Congratulations. So anyway, just standing there, just kind of, okay, that's this moment, y'all. I love when the scripture is just, just breaks it down. Like there's, what is happening in this? And just, so Jesus turns around and he's like, guys, what do you want? And this is what they said. It even gets even weirder. They said to Jesus, where are you staying? What hotel you at? Mm-hmm. Where are you staying? Where are you, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Where, where are you staying? And, and, and so Jesus goes, come and see. So it's a powerful come and see moment. And he invites them to his house. And it said it's about four o'clock in the afternoon. And, and, and here's what this, it says. They, they hung out with Jesus and they actually stayed the night. They stayed and camped with Jesus or whatever they did in that place. But they stayed with, with Jesus. And, and, it, and it's, this is the profound thing. This is the one thing that I want you to get out of the whole day. This was the first slumber party that Jesus ever had. Jesus invites them into the house that he's staying. Now in Jewish history, we know and understand in Hebrew history, we understand that when you invite someone to the house, that it's not just, hey, let's hang out or hey, let's grab a bite to eat. It's actually one of the most intimate things you can do among friends. What Jesus invited, when you invite somebody into your home, even us in our American culture, it's, it's personal. You know what it communicates? That you're important and I want you to join in what I'm doing. I want you to participate. Now, if you got those friends that stay too late at your house, you want them to participate till about 9.15 and then get on out because you, you know what I'm saying? Anybody? Okay, yeah. But Jesus invited them and I love the way this group, thanks guys. And I love the way this scripture worded it because it says they followed him to the house and they got more than they could ever imagine. They ended up following him the rest of their lives. 
Andrew and the other disciple follow Jesus for the rest of their lives. It gets even better. Andrew was so excited about this, he rushed to Peter. Let, let's pick up in the scripture. I want you to see this. It says he rushed to find his brother Simon and tell him that they had found the one who was promised, God's anointed one who will heal the world. And as Andrew approached with Simon, Jesus looked into him. Your name is Simon and your father is called John. But from this day forward, you will be known as Peter the Rock. And this was Caesarea. This was in in the other synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We know this moment. Remember, this is the big moment that Peter had before the Lord, where Peter says, you, I mean, Jesus says to Peter, you are the rock. and, And upon this revelation, I will build my church. At that moment, Andrew was probably like, yeah, I brought him to this church. I brought him to this thing. But then a few sentences later, Jesus looks at Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. And, and man, Andrew probably dropped him like, he was like, uh-uh, I don't know him. Peter, who? I have no idea who this guy is. But interestingly enough, we only know Andrew's name in the Bible just like three times. But look at how, look what the effect he had. We know Peter because he's all through the gospels and he gives us so much courage because of some of the things that he said and did. But, but Peter preached a message to 3,000 people at the birth of the church in Acts chapter 2. Andrew never preached a message. We have no message or sermon preached by Andrew in the Bible. But would Peter ever preach a message had Andrew not rushed to him and get him to the feet of Jesus? I don't know. I wonder, I wonder if sometimes we go, I can't do that. I'll never preach a message like that. But what if you saw your life as a message? What if you saw your gifts and, and your experience and, and whatever, whatever arena you serve in and live in and work in, whatever your space is, what if you saw that as your platform? And what if you saw the, the opportunity that God gave you wasn't just to follow him and sit in a chair, but what if he followed you, you follow him and he gave you an assignment and a purpose to rush to somebody? Here's the question, who are you running after today? Is it your kids? Is it your spouse? Not not your kids. You know, you may be running after them because they're about to get spanked. Put on, uh, 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 they're going to be grounded. But but what is God, what has he given you after running after? And listen, I, Running after her career is ambitious. Running after money is, is, you know, is not, I know we have to have it, but, but, but being rich or having that kind of influence, man, that's gonna fade away. Are we running after things that are temporal or have we given our lives to something that is eternal? And it doesn't mean quit your job and go to the mission field. It means use your job as the mission field. It doesn't mean that sometimes we compartmentalize the following of Jesus and actually the purpose and the assignment that God's given us to be him everywhere we go. And as much as I love the church, I love the house, you are a carrier of this house everywhere you go. The church is not the walls. The church is not the, the, the dome or the sprung structure. The church is you. You are the one that had a personal encounter with Jesus. And all you do is you look for open opportunities that God opens up for you to do it. And for Peter, for Andrew, Peter was an open opportunity. And then it goes on. The scripture says that then he, he uh, followed Jesus with him. It says the next day, Jesus set out to go to Galilee. And when he came upon Philip, he invited him to join them. Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, came from a town called Bethsaida. And he decided to make, his, make the journey with him. Philip found Nathaniel a friend and burst into the excitement. He found the one Moses wrote about in uh, him in the law. All the prophets spoke of the day when he would come and now he is here. His name is Jesus, son of Joseph, the carpenter, and he comes from Nazareth. Look at this ripple effect. See, when I have a heart for others, there's this ripple effect in my life. John found Andrew. Andrew found Peter. Jesus found Philip. Philip found Nathaniel. Who are you finding? Because we know from these guys, God did something in them and through them that really I'd love for our team to work on it and see how this one person, it spread throughout the entire world. While we know we don't have any recorded message of Andrew's sermons, we know he went to Asia and the continent of Asia was changed with the gospel because Andrew took the message there. He invited, his life became an invitation. And really you can't follow Jesus without your life becoming an invitation. It is not enough for me to stop with this just being my home. 
Now I have to make sure it's a home for others. And the statistics, man, like they're working for us. It really stinks when they're not. But man, it is so encouraging to me that seven out of 10 people, if I'll just invite them, they'll find their way to a a local church. And that 25 to 35% of them, I have a big chance of doing the rest of my life with that group of people. And even if they're not in this house, that they find a house, that they find the place where where they belong. The the story goes on. Nathaniel was a skeptic and he, he... he didn't really think that anything special could come from Nazareth. And maybe you've heard that statement before. What good can come from Nazareth? Because it was such a small and insignificant town. But that didn't stop Philip from telling him something very significant came from this place. And his interaction with Jesus is so cool because Jesus isn't afraid to get to, to the doubt, to get to the, the, the junk, to get for whatever reason why, why he didn't believe in Jesus or think that the disciples were telling the truth. It wasn't, it wasn't the disciples' job to convince Nathaniel about Jesus. It was the power of their invitation that gave Jesus an opportunity for Jesus to convince Nathaniel that he knew who he was. So many times we take the pressure on that, man, I, I, you know, this person's, I, I don't even know if they'll ever come. I don't even know if, they'll, if I could ever t- see their lives change. I don't even see, think about how lost you were and how found you are now. Look at where he brought you and where he found you. And every day, if you remember that, then there's hope for other people. Listen, if there's hope for me, there is hope for other people. If he can take a mess like me, if he can take a mess like you, you call me a mess? Yeah, I am. Because we were all messed up and Jesus found us. And we have no reason to be here if it weren't for him and his goodness. And here's the heart that we get to reflect. We get to reflect the heart of the Father when we have a heart for others. The Lord says, this is one of my favorite places in scripture because Jesus tells Nathaniel, you didn't see me, but I saw you. You didn't, you didn't know me and believe in me, but I saw you under the tree. I saw you over there before you ever came to the church. I saw you before, I saw you when people were leaving you. I saw you when when there was abuse happening. I saw when regret was happening. I saw when you were doing the things that you were doing and you thought that you weren't worthy, that you didn't think you deserved an invitation, but somebody loved you enough. Philip loved Nathaniel enough to extend an invitation. And now Nathaniel knows Jesus and knows the heart of his father because somebody invited him to the feet of Jesus. See, Philip had such confidence that he knew if Nathaniel could just get Jesus, he would be changed forever. Sean had such confidence in the presence of God that he knew if Morge and his family could just get in the presence of Jesus, that Jesus changes everything, that Jesus leaves you marked, that Jesus takes care of eternity, that Jesus takes care of your past, that Jesus takes care of broken hearts, that Jesus heals marriages, that Jesus heals bodies, that Jesus heals your kids, that Jesus takes care of all the details, that Jesus heals anxiety, that Jesus heals depression, that Jesus repairs everything that's broken and stolen. It just takes a people that are crazy enough to believe that if somebody can just get face to face with Jesus, that he will mark them and do what no man can do. And in this house, there's an assignment and a purpose on your life if you call yourself a life gator. I love the power of gathering. But the significance of a church is not how many it can gather, it's how many it sends. And how many are we sending? I love how many we gather on Sunday. Praise God. But how many are we sending? Do you feel sent when you leave here? I want you to feel full, but I want you to feel so full that you're overflowing that I got to get here next week and I got to make sure I don't just got to get here for me. I got to, I got to make sure as many people as I know, know that they have a place. I care enough about them to invite you in to the house. And we've got to have enough confidence in Jesus. Do we really believe that he can change the darkest of hearts, the lost of souls? That's how we're motivated. And as much as I love this house and I want people to come because we love the house, we got to love Jesus more. We got to have enough confidence that, man, if I can just get them to the feet of Jesus, Jesus will do the stuff that I can't do. You can't fix anybody. I can't fix anybody. You can't preach a message enough or sing a song hard enough to change somebody. But you know what? Who will will change? Jesus, his presence.
the power of his Holy Spirit, a moment in his presence changes anything. Demons flee, sickness leaves, salvation comes. Woo, there's just nobody like Jesus. Come on, will you just join me and honor him in this place? Lord, we honor you. Jesus, we lift up the name as above all other names. God, we recognize in this moment that we wouldn't be here if it weren't for you. God, thank you for the invitation to follow you. God, I thank you for my parents, for the invitation they gave me when I was six and told me, hey, you can follow Jesus. Thank you that I got invited and people saw that I was important enough to be a part. And Jesus, we just thank you today. We recognize as a church that you've given us a mission in this city. God, we thank you for Villarica. God, we declare over LifeGate that we, while we're at the, the beginning of the city, that you've placed us here very strategically to be a spiritual gateway of life for those that are far from you, those that need a home. And God, we don't wanna just be a people that gather and say there's no place like home for us. God, we wanna be a home for others. And so God, we're asking right now, would you stir in us more than ever a heart for others, a heart for those who aren't here yet, that we would exist and we, were gather, we would actually gather for the purpose of reaching others the Phillips, the Nathaniels, the Andrews, the Peters, the people that you've placed around our lives, beginning with our homes, our community, and all the world. So Lord, we just say a fresh yes to you to be a part of your purpose, to be a part of your plan. In this place, there's no place like home. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I wanna invite you to say yes to Jesus, maybe for the first time or maybe for the second time, maybe for the hundredth time. Maybe you need a fresh start today. Maybe you need a new start. The Bible says that when we believe in him, when you put your personal faith in Jesus, that he becomes your personal savior. The Bible says that if we don't know him, that we're really lost, that we're blind. And while heaven is a real place, the only way that we get there is by believing in Jesus and putting our trust in him. It's the only way we get forgiveness of our sins and all that we've done wrong. But he wants to spend eternity with you and he wants to spend Monday with you. He wants a personal relationship with you and we're not gonna embarrass you or call you out or make you say anything or do anything. This is really a personal decision in your heart, but I would be so honored to lead you in a prayer and a commitment to him. And so in the next moment, I'm gonna ask you just to slip your hand and put it right back down. Just put, slip your hand up, put it right back down. Today, if you wanna meet Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. If you want to come back home to him, thank you. Thank you. Way to go. Hands all over the room. Do you want to join these others? Say yes to him. If you're watching online right now, you could put something in the comment bar, put a hand up or, or maybe DM us and tell us, man, I'm praying this prayer today. I'm saying yes to Jesus. I'm saying yes again. I'm going to give you some words to pray in this moment. You just pray it in your heart, but pray it with all your heart. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending Jesus. Jesus, I believe you're real. I believe you're alive and well and, and that you came and lived on this earth 2,000 years ago and you died on the cross and rose again for me. You bridged the gap between sin and uh, between me and God and you took care of sin and selfishness and sickness and all the things that divided me from knowing God. Thank you for being my savior. Thank you for the invitation to follow you the rest of my days. Today, I say yes to you. I commit my life to you. I thank you that one day I'll see you face to face in a place called heaven, that my eternity is secure and sure because of you. I love you, Jesus. Thank you so much for loving me. In your name I pray, amen.